Well, good evening, Village Zendo. Um, my name is Daishi, and I see um, many familiar faces, but also some, some new ones, which is great. Um, and it's, it's wonderful to see, to see everybody. Um, I am likely a new face to some of you as well. Um, I have not lived in New York City for many years. And so uh, even before COVID, I practiced with you from a distance, uh, coming to New York City and retreats whenever I could. Um, in fact, tonight, I am speaking to you from the Netherlands, where it is uh, about midnight. And I have lived midnight every day of my life, but I can honestly say that this is the first time that I have sat alone in an attic, uh, wearing robes, staring at and uh, talking to my computer, while downstairs my two boys and wife will hopefully remain unbothered and asleep. So this is a new, unfamiliar, and strange midnight. Um, and in preparing for this night, I was reminded of how uh, strangeness has been a constant companion for me on my Zen journey. I'm wondering if you remember the first time that you left home to sit facing the wall for five or 10 days. How about um, putting on robes at four or five in the morning? Um, if not that, what about the first time you heard the of the monitor's hand waking up the Kyusaku stick? How about balancing a rakasu on top of your head and chanting the verse of the kesa, koan practice, um, or maybe just shuffling from you know, one room to the next with gaze lowered and then catching out of the corner of your eye, the tenzo kind of diligently preparing the meal for the day, um, or the chidin, smoothing the surface of a incense bowl with the back of a bent spoon. And, you know, if this all now feels normal to you, isn't that too a bit strange? Both inside and outside of formal Zen practice, I think strangeness abounds. And strangeness has some uh, negative connotations attached to it. Like when the, the, the delta or the difference or the space between what is expected and what is experienced is filled with suspicion instead of uh, curiosity. Like as in, there is something strange about that guy. But what I'm talking about is a particular kind of strangeness, which very well may be difficult um, or challenging but is also beautiful and liberating because it, it um, 
cracks away at living from a place of, of habit, uh, automation, uh, and reaction. This kind of strangeness as, as far as I know, or at least where I kind of found it first, uh, was coined by Viktor Shklovowski, uh, a Russian literary theorist and critic, uh, who in a short and important essay that he wrote in 1970, 1917, entitled uh, Art as Technique, kind of coined this idea of aesthetic strangeness. Um, here's a small part of that essay. Habit or habitualization devours work, clothes, furniture, one's wife, and the fear of war. I'm going to read that again. Habitualization devours our work, clothes, furniture, one's wife, partner, friend, sangha member, and the fear of war. And art exists that one may recover the sensation of life. Uh, it exists to make one feel things, to make the stone stony. The purpose of art is to impart the sensation of things as they are perceived and not as they are known. The technique of art is to make objects unfamiliar. In our Zen language, I think he is talking about suchness, that which makes the stone stony and midnight, midnight again. Uh, the, the concept introduced by Shklovowski in this essay is sometimes translated as estrangement. And, and I think estrangement, even more than strangeness uh, itself, has a lot of negative connotations, uh, associations. If you're estranged, you're, you're separate from and in a bad way. If you're estranged from someone, you're, you're separate from someone and in a bad way or on bad terms. But estrangement is also a, a gate to, to intimacy as much as a barrier. Um, and it certainly has been for me in my, my practice. Um, so my first uh, intensive retreat was a 10 day Vipassana course in Barrie, Massachusetts. And it was quite a difficult experience for me. Um, you could say I was overwhelmed by all the strangeness. And on about day six or seven, I tried to write about my experience, um, hoping uh, that it would help. Uh, hoping that it would help me make sense of my experience, um, and it did not. <laughs> uh, quite the opposite. My, my writing felt performative, um, kind of disingenuous, and, and my words felt like a, like a veneer of knowing uh, over this like torrent of confusion. And in, in the act of writing, I, was, I really feel like I was disconnecting from myself. Um, my meditation periods were painful, but they also felt somehow like a true authentic expression. Um, like regardless of how upsetting my meditation periods were, at least I was just being me and not trying to be me. I, I continued to write on that retreat and eventually 
uh, found a way to do so that felt good in my body. I would, I would write, but often just a few words uh, without judgment, uh, without interpretation or reflection about what was present for me, um, however strange it may be. And uh, that retreat was you know, probably 20 years ago. And I still add to that document, um, most often on sessions. And I think part of what was happening for me on that first retreat is that through this simple but profound act of sitting, I had become estranged, not so much from myself, but from who I thought I was. Uh, the self, the self experienced was not the same as the self conceptualized. And that space between was really disturbing to me. Um, and these, these poetic fragments uh, then became a vehicle to get to know myself. Um, little offerings of myself to myself. I, um, I was writing, but in, again, in a new and therefore kind of strange way. Um, you know, from early Buddhist suttas through to the Mah Mahayana texts of this lineage, this non-identification is a theme of practice. Um, for example, in our study text for this Ango period, the Komyo Zozan Mai, or the practice of the treasury of luminosity, Kou Eju Zenji asks that we, quote, don't push away the arising of thoughts or crave them. Don't identify. And I guess part of what I wanted to do in this talk um, is to color in this don't identify. It sounds so simple. Uh, and for sure, uh, sometimes it is. A thought arises, is noted, and gently goes. But if the identification is strong and sticky, then the non-identification can feel like a kind of painful whole body and mind separation. Um, an estrangement. Have you had these experiences of estrangement in your practice? Where you are um, not ready to leave or be left, uh, not by a thought, but by a loved one, um, or a part of who you think you are. There's a touching story about Eijo that can be found in the Denko Roku. Um, after he received formal approval from Dogen, he followed him as his attendant uh, every day. In the text, it says he was, quote, like a shadow following the form for 20 years. Fukakusa Temple, which preceded Eiheiji, had strict rules uh, for when and how often monks could leave the temple. Twice a month, three days each time. And Eijo's mother uh, was terminally ill. She was dying. And he would visit her as often as allowable. Um, when she made a request to see him for the last time, he asked the community and Dogen uh, what they thought he should do um, as he had already used up all of his uh, allotted time outside of the temple walls. Both the community and Dogen encouraged Ajo 
to be with his dying mother one last time. Mm, but he did not go. Uh, his, his devotion to the practice and Dogen uh, was too, too strong, if perhaps strange to some of our ears. So did Ajo abandon his mother? Um, would he have abandoned his temple practice if he had left its walls? Are you going on summer session in a few days and leaving your home? Or will you stay home as the Sangha leaves for a retreat? If you Find yourself estranged by Zen. Be intimate with what arises. Um, I'll close with a gata from the document I started on my first retreat. Everyone gone, completely missed opportunity, my entry.